Amelia, welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight we have news for you, breaking news, that for whatever reason is being downplayed or ignored by other media outlets, but we think you want to know about it. Five simple words describe it. There was no Russian collusion. There was no evidence whatsoever that the Trump campaign conspired in any way with the government of Vladimir Putin during the last presidential election, period. That's apparently the conclusion of the bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee. That committee spent two years investigating this question, of course, hundreds of interviews, reams of classified documents, untold millions in taxpayer dollars. No collusion at all. That is what we are hearing tonight they have found. Now, if you've been following this story at all, and of course you have been, you will not be surprised by this. No Russian collusion is a lot like moon landing actually happened or abominable snowman was probably a long-haired mountain goat. You knew that already because you're not an idiot. But if so, compare your mental acuity to that of prominent political figures here in Washington. Next time you feel dumb, watch this tape. I think there's plenty of evidence of collusion or conspiracy in plain sight. Trump has the Kremlin clan surrounding him. There's more to be learned about it. I believe there's been collusion. It's starting to smell more and more uh, like collusion. We saw cold, hard evidence of the Trump campaign, indeed the Trump family, eagerly intending to collude, possibly, with Russia. Mm, smells like collusion. Plenty of evidence of collusion. Hard evidence of collusion. In the end, it was all fake. And they knew that. They knew it wasn't real. They were lying from the very first day. Only their remarkable aggression, their willingness to say literally anything, no matter how outrageous or slanderous or vile, kept the rest of us from catching on to what they were doing. If the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee is willing to call someone a traitor to this country, there's got to be some truth to it, right? Actually, no, there wasn't. It was always a hoax. Adam Schiff is an unscrupulous charlatan. That's the real lesson here. Don't expect people like Schiff to apologize, though, or correct the record, much less repair the lives of the people they have destroyed. Carter Page still can't find a job. Roger Stone is still facing life in prison. Meanwhile, Schiff's PR team on the other channel continues like none of this ever happened. Here's Malcolm Nance of MSNBC explaining that the results of a two-year Senate investigation mean nothing. People are guilty because we say they're guilty. We must punish them. Let me just say one thing. When Benedict Arnold gave the plans to West Point to Major Andre, and they captured Major Andre, they did not have any real information linking those plans to Benedict Arnold, other than the fact that he was in his presence at one point during that day. But everyone knew it was treason when they caught the man and they hung him. So at some point, there is going to be a bridge of data here that is going to be unassailable. No one had any evidence, but everyone knew it was treason when they caught the man and they hung him. That says it all. Let's repeat that once again slowly so you can write down those words and put them on your fridge as a memento of the terrifying mass hysteria we've all just lived through. Quote, everyone knew it was treason when they caught the man and they hung him. That's our country now. That's what the Russia insanity has done to us. The real government shutdown has lasted for nearly two and a half years. That's one percent of this country's entire existence. We no longer have meaningful policy debates in Washington. We have investigations instead. Nobody can think clearly. Everybody's afraid. The country's core problems don't even rate as interesting anymore, either to legislators or the TV pundits who comment on legislators. The suicide rate just hit a 50-year high. Did you know that? We're in the middle of the worst drug epidemic in the history of America, including the one after the Civil War and the heroin epidemic of the 70s and the crack epidemic of the 80s. This is way worse. And it's one of the reasons the life expectancy in many parts of the country is dropping. This is starting to look like Boris Yeltsin's Russia. And yet nobody in Washington even notices. All Adam Schiff and the rest of the wild-eyed morons can think about is Vladimir Putin, collusion, our hack democracy, and all the other mindless slogans they've repeated long enough to half believe. We've spent two years perpetuating a fraud, and they are still doing it. What is this? It's negligence on a stunning scale. It has nothing to do with Trump. It has everything to do with running this country, and they're not. Historians will look back on this moment in amazement and in sadness. Who put these crackpots in charge and let them break things? 
Why didn't any responsible person in the media say anything about it? Why did they collude in the charade? What the hell happened to America? History will judge us for this moment. Adam Schiff's grandkids will be ashamed of what he did. A freshman Democrat in Congress forced to apologize after members of both parties accused her of anti-Semitism for tweeting, it's all about the Benjamins, baby, suggesting lawmakers are being bribed to support the country of Israel. It's not the first time Ilhan Omar has made anti-Israeli remarks, and fellow Congress members, including our next guest, are calling to kick her off the Foreign Affairs Committee. Republican Congressman from New York, Lee Zeldin, joins us from D.C. Lee, good morning to you. Good morning. You say there's a double standard. Why? Yeah, just last month you had House Democrats tripping all over each other, running to the floor of the House of Representatives to condemn white supremacy in a resolution that named uh, Congressman Steve King. Uh, he apologized. He was still thrown off of his committee assignments. Uh, now we have those same members, many of them tripping all over each other, running away from the House floor so they don't have to condemn anti-Semitism. And they are accepting an apology uh, via Twitter that uh, unfortunately uh, is not the end of it. This is also isn't the first time. The apology itself states that it's an unequivocal apology, but it's filled with equivocation. And as you just played that tweet that said all about the Benjamin's baby and how Congressman Omar uh, was tweeting at me last week that uh, right. said thank you next from Ariana Grande, her apology comes across as you know, sorry, not sorry from Demi Lovato. I don't take it as a as a, a real sincere apology. And when she was asked about it last night on video, uh, you see a lack of empathy and, and true understanding. Well, what do you make of uh, Nancy Pelosi's response? Well, I think it's good that she spoke out yesterday. I think it was uh, great over the course of 24 hours from Sunday evening uh, that you had a lot of people breaking their silence, speaking out about this anti-Semitic trope. Uh, it is infiltrating. It's anti-Semitic, and there's anti-Israel hate that's infiltrating American politics. We're seeing it on college campuses. Uh, it's infiltrating the halls of Congress. You can't empower that. You can't elevate it. You have to confront it, and you have to crush it, or it will just continue to grow legs. Uh, we'll see it more and more like a cancer across our country. So I'm hearing from 18, 19, 20-year-olds on college campuses who have multiple stories, Jewish students right. of, con of, of confronting anti-Semitism. I, 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 I think it's good to speak up, but uh, right. you know, there's more that needs to get done in this case. What do you mean it's infiltrating the halls of Congress? That's disturbing. Yeah, well, we're seeing a, so in 2008, 2012, 2016, the Democratic National Convention, there was a move to put in anti-Israel, pro-BDS language, uh, and, and more that, unfor that fortunately didn't make its way in. Right. You're going to see that exposed again in 2020, uh, but right now with new freshman members that are, are elected to Congress uh, and some of their uh, positions and statements, as well as associations of other members of Congress with people like Louis Farrakhan, Tamika Mallory, Linda Sarsour, right. uh, those associations are problematic as well. You're not going to drop this, are you? No, I, I, I shouldn't. I, I'm hearing from people from not just my district, but from all across the country who are, who are outraged by the growing amount of anti-Semitism here in our country and around the world. They want to confront it. And they, they're not going to just turn a blind eye, put, dig their, put their head uh, under the sand and, and be ignorant and naive to what the reality is, understanding that this isn't just a one-time offense. This has happened over the course of several years with this member. Uh, and when she was asked about the reaction to her positions and statements last Last week, she called it exciting. Uh, so if she if she's going to be out there and uh, and and you know, with a position that is encouraging uh, a very negative atmosphere right. uh, that you know, innocent American Jews and others are going to confront, uh, well then I'm not going to be silent about it. Uh, I'm going to confront it. All right, well, you're doing that uh, this morning on this program, Lee Zeldin, Congressman from New York. Lee, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. We're back with my next guest. He's the investigative journalist behind a new opinion piece this morning published in The Hill. It is titled The Case for Russia Collusion Against the Democrats. Joining me right now is John Solomon. And, John, it is good to have you on the program this morning. You've done excellent work on this Thank story you. we know for the last two years. I'm going to get to your new op-ed in a moment, but give me a reaction to what we just heard from Senator Lindsey Graham. Yeah, great interview. You pinned him down on something that we've all been trying to find out. Who is he going to subpoena? He mentioned a bunch of names, including everybody, James Comey, and uh, the entire gang that signed the FISA. That's very important news. One name I didn't hear, but I'm curious to see if he will, will be Christopher Steele, the author of the dossier. I think that would be an interesting turn of events.
Um, and, and he said whoever signed that, that FISA warrant that was done four times, that has to include Rod Rosenstein and Sally Yates to get Absolutely. subpoenaed. Absolutely. That's big news. I, I agree. What are you hearing about Michael Horowitz? The inspector general is also working on this side-by-side -side track uh, to Lindsey Graham, as he put it. Uh, what are you hearing there? Yeah. He's a great investigator. By all accounts of the people who've been involved, he's been doing a very thorough review of this FISA case. And I, I would, what I'm hearing is sometime between April and June, July time frame, he'll release his findings. And I, I would expect that those are essential to this entire narrative. And we're going to learn a lot more facts that are already out there. I mean, Mark Meadows, Jim Jordan, Devin Nunez have done a great job getting some of this information out. But there's still a lot of dark, dirty secrets that we don't know about what went on behind the scenes of the FBI. Well, we know that they um, went to the FISA court and did not give all of the information about the dossier. So right. they, they did not tell the court that, in fact, Hillary Clinton and the Democrats paid for it, and it was all political opposition research uh, as opposed to some real informative report. It was actually salacious and unverified, as Jim Coleman yeah. said himself. So in, in terms of uh, the catalysts on this, are we ever going to get accountability? Because if you hear Adam Schiff and the Democrats on the Intel Committee talk about this and Jerry Nadler, um, right. it, they're focused on a whole host of other investigations about President Trump's tax reform, uh, tax returns. Yeah, and there's no doubt the, the accountability is going to have to come from the Senate, uh, where where the Republicans have that committee. The Judiciary Committee has to come from the President, who can declassify all those FISA documents. I think the release of those documents will show how much exculpatory evidence the FBI had about Trump not colluding that it didn't tell the court, and that will make this an even more serious matter. Uh, but I think it's going to have to come for those. And then, of course, the IG and the new attorney general, Bill Barr, who's the new sheriff in town soon and has the ability to start holding people to account, something that Rod Rosenstein doesn't seem to have done during his tenure. John, you're breaking some news this morning in your new opinion piece about collusion and the Democrats. I want to take right. a short break on, on that note. I want to come back and I want you to list for us where you have found collusion between the Democrats uh, and the Russians, and uh, whether or not we'll see accountability there. We're back with John Solomon, investigative reporter. And, John, tell us about your new op-ed out this morning. Yep, so I have a, a new, new article out that identifies uh, more than a dozen instances in which Democratic uh, players in the Russia scandal had contact with Russians. And I'll just use one good example. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but Christopher Steele's primary source for all the evidence that he put in the dossier, gave to the FBI, uh, was a, a retired Russian intelligence operative. Very important for people to know. He took information from Russia as a foreign agent himself, a Brit, gave it to the FBI. The FBI gave it to the court, even though it was unverified. And that's how we launched this investigation. So the article goes through a dozen of those sort of contacts. And what, what you're seeing as the evidence of Russia collusion by Donald Trump wanes and dissolves into what it was, a political dirty trick, the evidence of the Democrats working the Russians to influence the election is starting to grow. I, I understand that. Then why is it that the Democrats have been so successful in this narrative of Donald Trump has dealt with the Russians. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of media hysteria. Let's go back to the early 2017 period. All those front page stories in the Washington Post and New York Times, uh, CNN. I think we'll look back at history and look at those and see a lot of those were false or misleading, overstated. And uh, the evidence that was being leaked to them actually was uncorroborated at the time. And that got that hysteria going. It gave the Democrats a wonderful platform to launch their investigations. Uh, but now we have the, the benefit of time. And as we learn more and more information, we see it for what it was. It was a political dirty trick designed to uh, harm the election and to uh, delegitimize President Trump after the election. Your piece also goes back to talk about the Skokovo project. I remember right. this project because I was covering it as well back in the day in the early 2000s when Russia wanted to become the new Silicon Valley. And they were encouraging American companies to go and share information there. That's right. and, 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 you, and you say that Hillary Clinton was involved. She was. In fact, she was the driving force in the United States. She invited Medvedev to come to the United States and visit Silicon Valley. She arranged for several executives to go over and start sharing information with the Russians. What information were they great. sharing? You're saying this was a national security issue. 
It was, absolutely. And I think what, we, what ends up happening is a few years later, both the United States military and the FBI counterintelligence division raised warnings that this Skokovo was actually used by the Russians to bleed information of our best technology, our best military technology. So something that sounded good got put in foundation donors involved. At the end of the day, it became a threat to national security, something very similar to what we heard in Uranium One. And so they, these are areas that the Republicans haven't fully investigated, but perhaps in 2019 they'll come to light. All right, we will leave it there. John Solomon, good to see you this morning, sir. Thanks so much.